all that this message uh, came from not from somebody authenticated, then you you can start reconfiguring routes, and if you don't have uh, an, an alternate path for that particular uh, host, then you have to discover a new one. So you can create a lot of problems and a lot of instability in the system. But as I said, these are not the difficult attacks. These we know how to deal with, and they're specific to any um, protocol. There are some other attacks that are quite specific to wireless, and it's more difficult to deal with them. So one of them is something that is called wormhole attack. So the idea in a wormhole attack is that an adversary has the ability to establish, um, it's called a tunnel or a wormhole. It has two <laughs> nodes, at least two nodes that he compromised, and he has the ability to tunnel packets through this uh, through this connection much faster than if the packets will tra travel normally through the network. Now, how do, you get, how do you get such a tunnel? Well, by not playing, the, the, the easiest way to get it is by not playing the protocol correctly. Because of the way the wireless uh, um, technology works, in order to avoid collisions, uh, because in wireless one of the big problems is that you cannot detect that a collision happened when two people try to send at the same time. So you try to avoid collisions happening. And the way, the way the avoidance is implemented is by having all kinds of timeouts in, in the protocol. So I'm not going to send immediately and I want. I have, to, I have to wait. Everybody has to wait certain amounts of time be, beside, before sending certain type of data. So if, I, if I'm an attacker that I refuse to play the protocol, I can, I can get my data much faster than the others because I made, it, I made it through the network, but nobody else can send. And what this type of attack can have is once I can enforce it, I can, I can use this tunnel as an attacker to disturb the routing. Just because, again, I can control the path. I made it much faster. So my packet will be the one that will enforce what the path selection is going to be because of the metric. Okay? It's very difficult to defend against such an attack. The only thing that you can do is just to de you have to detect that the packet traveled faster. And it's not very easy to do that. Okay? Now, another attack that is also specific to wireless is something that is called flood rushing. If you remember when I was talking about the way flood di the route discovery works, there is a first flood that happens in the network. And if you have, again, an attacker that has the ability to rush this flood packet in the network, maybe using a wormhole, maybe using uh, by uh, refusing to play the, the protocol or one thing that you can do also, you can play with the transmission uh, level and the power. And so there are all kinds of things that you can do by refusing to play exactly the way the protocol was specified. Now, if I, an, as an attacker, I manage to do this, again, I can control the way path is selected. It's not easy to, uh, to defend against it. This is actually an attack that is very difficult to defend against. Why? Because the routing design, the, the design of the routing protocol really required to use to process only the first flood. If you process more than the one, you have an overhead. So here, there is a trade-off between having a design of the protocol that has a higher overhead or taking the risk of having such an attack. And as we will see uh, um, soon, the, this is actually one of the, this attack uh, has a very high implication on how much damage an attacker can create in a network. Now, the last thing uh, that I mentioned before, once a node has control over the path, one thing that he can do is just drop packets. And this is, uh, he can, why can the packets be dropped? Well, there can be errors, and that's something that you cannot do anything about it. But a lot of them can be just really deliberately dropping data. And what makes this problem difficult is that in general, in an environment that is distributed, here we have multiple participants, you know, connected in this network, in an environment that is distributed, it is, um, for in, in particular case, it, it was proven that it is impossible to figure out if that packet didn't make it because it was dropped or because it was a fault. And you have to, there are ways in which you can go around the problem, but at higher cost and by weakening your requirements. Now, this is a summary of the many attacks that can happen uh, and what kind of attackers can we have. But let me tell you a little bit, uh, OK. I also have a list here with related work, but I'm going to focus. I want to tell you more about uh, our protocols, but I'll be very happy to talk with you about. Um, in just one word, there is a lot of work in targeting particular attacks, but there is no protocol that actually tries to cover all of them. 
particularly the dropping. So detecting that data was dropped um, usually has a high cost and people avoid to do it. They just say, I'm going to do just authentication and integrity, which is not necessarily bad because those are basic things that you have to have anyway. Now, let me tell you a little bit about uh, this protocol. So what is the goal? The goal is the, the following. Assuming that I have a source, I have a destination, and um, I, don't, I don't make any assumption about how many parts in between them are compromised, but the assumption that I'm making is that there is a correct path between these two guys. If there is no correct or no adversarial free path, there is nothing I can do. But if such a path exists, then my goal is to detect it and to use that to deliver data. That's, that's really the goal of this uh, protocol. And there, there are several design principles or um, approaches with respect to designing it. It's still an on-demand protocol. It has a um, flood, uh, flood uh, request and flood reply, which is the route discovery phase. What is special about it, as I said, we don't make any assumptions about the nodes in between. So the flooding the network on the way there and on the way back, it's really a requirement. Because otherwise, it may be that you reach only the people that are malicious. And they can drop also the routing discovery packets. And you're never going to establish the path. Okay. Uh, the other thing that, that uh, is different about the approach that we are taking, we are not trying, for example, with respect to wormholes to prevent their formation. All that we care about in the end is the impact that this can have on the service itself. So if we detect that something bad happens, that's when we are trying to readjust the path and to avoid the links that are problematic. The other thing that we are doing is because we are not able to pinpoint I told you about the impossibility of saying why that data didn't make it. We cannot say exactly this particular node is the node that created the problem. Why? Because this guy will say, oh, it's not my fault. It's the fault of this guy. And he will say the other thing. And there is no way you can make a decision. What we are doing, we basically we, we, um, uh, mark links and not nodes. So with respect to routing, that is fine because that's all we care about. The other thing that we do, and that's actually the most problematic, <coughs> part is um, when, we, when the data makes it hop by hop, we have a mechanism in place that prevents any intermediate hope from modifying data that was already put on the packet by previous hopes. And that, that, is, that prevents, for example, somebody from making the path long, looking longer or shorter. And the other thing that we, the, the way we achieve um, uh, or we readjust the path is every link has some metric associated with it. If we discover that on one particular link many packets are dropped, we readjust, we, we readjust the weight on that path. And the way we are readjusting the weights on each link, uh, it is done in such a, uh, we do this in such a way that we can bound the amount of data that can be dropped in the network. Uh, and we, we bound this logarithmically. Okay? Um, the other thing that I should mention is that once some paths or some links are excluded, they are never out forever. That's where the bounding comes into place. We allow them, if for a certain amount of time they are behaving nicely, uh, we are allow them to, to come back in the network by adjusting again the weight. So this is like an overview of the protocol. We have a route discovery phase that will, will, uh, uh, you know, will um, have as an output a pass, and then uh, that's the pass that we are going to use to uh, route packets. In case we detect that there's something on, wrong going on with respect to data forwarding, we had a Byzantine fault detection mechanism that allows us to detect what are the links that are causing problems. And the result of this will be one faulty link or a set of faulting links. And then we applied, we have this link, link weight management mechanism that uh, uh, modifies the weights in a way that it bounds the amount of damage. We get a new list, and then we again we apply the route discovery. So this is a, an overview of the protocol. Um, I want to tell you I, I want to tell you a little bit about fault detection uh, mechanism. So traditionally, um, one one thing first that I forgot to mention is that in the way our path is detected, uh, we know the whole path. So when a, some, a source uh, routes to the destination, he knows the whole path. So that allows us 